I'm Allison Prophet. I'm the editor of BioIT World, and I am glad that you're here. We've got um, a good conversation. Well, I'm expecting a good conversation. We had a good conversation on the phone planning this, so uh, I'm very hopeful it's going to go well. Um, so I'm here with Tanya, John, Jerry, and Liwa, and I am going to. I think behind you. We're going to curve around a little bit so we can see each other. Exactly. <coughs> okay. So when we had some calls and lots of emails discussing what we wanted to talk about. Not talking about you. Sorry. <laughs> Whew. Um, one of the things that kept coming up was the definition of data science and how everybody has different definitions of data science. So right away, we wanted to cut through some of the hype um, and get some real definitions of data science on paper, digital paper. Uh, so that we can sort of define our conversation. So, Tonya, do you want to get us started with the definition and, and maybe tell me how data science fits in at your organization? Sure. Um, so, I don't think anyone really has a gold standard of what data science is still. We all have our opinions and we'll discuss them, but uh, to me it's a combination of some of these things that are mentioned up on the screen. Uh, it's everything from that nasty data munging and dirty janitorial work to summarizing and exploring data and ultimately visualizing it. But the whole point is that we're trying to optimize the decision process, right? If you can't make a decision or take an action on your analysis, it's essentially rendered useless. Uh, so I think how you actually go from data to that insight, uh, we'll talk about a whole different bunch of tools and ways, but uh, ultimately it's all about the, the quality of your end results and if you're able to act on them. Uh, and how we use data science at TCB yeah. Analytics. We work with a whole bunch of pharmaceutical companies, uh, CROs, uh, as well as we, uh, we do a lot of training um, with both hospitals and uh, universities in the, the Boston area. Um, so there's a lot of cool stuff happening, especially uh, I'm noticing in hospitals that hopefully we can talk about later. Cool. John? Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I guess uh, my definition, oops. That's Jerry. Jerry Tag, you're it. <laughs> That's John. Okay. Back to right. um, <clears throat> So a couple things. Uh, a little bit of the foundation, you know, what's, uh, I guess, the substrate versus what's the catalyst. Uh, also, what data science is, isn't. Um, a component that's very important with data science is, is data. But uh, it doesn't mean only big data. This is why I, I use the word very um, specifically, uh, where is it, broad scale data. So certainly you have to know how to navigate big data, but frankly, some of the most elegant data sciences applications we've seen at Alexion involve data that could fit on, on a laptop. So how do you handle like boulders and pebbles and all the scales in between? Um, something that's very consistent in data sciences is, is the heterogeneity and complexity of data that typically needs to be, be pulled together. And once you have those pieces, that's the substrate. The catalyst now are all the analytics, you know, all the algorithmics, um, the statistics, the mathematics, um, the modeling that, that you do on top. Um, a very important aspect of data sciences uh, is how, what is the question that you're trying to ask? Uh, this is something that I find or can be very um, controversial, actually. Some folks feel build a big data lake, put all the data in it, and let's see kind of what swamp monster might emerge from it and you know, ha have it. You know. I, I, I view very strongly you start with a question tells you what data to pull together. It tells you what tools to pull out of the toolbox. And then very importantly, you have a measure of success. You have an answer. Right? Um, finally, what data sciences is not is once you have the answer, it's very tempting to then say, well, how do we repeat this? How do we build a tool? How do we build a platform? And that's great. That's cool. That's important. But now this is the database, the stack, <coughs> the application tier, the UI, the systems engineering, the software engineering, the maintenance, the rollout. That's very different from data sciences. It's a close partner with data sciences. But I, our, our view at Alexion is data science is, is you ask the question, use all these tools that you see on the screen, and you get the answer. Right. Oh, and I, I guess I described a bit of our application there. Yeah. I guess the only point I would add is um, in rare diseases, which is Alexion's focus, the role of uh, genomics and genetics is rather intriguing. 70, 80% of rare diseases have a, a genetic uh, <coughs> Uh, pattern and so data sciences turns out to play a pretty critical role there. All right, Jerry. Okay, my view similar to what we've already heard, but a little bit different, and that is that a lot of us have been using data science for a long time. So many people haven't heard about the term over the have only heard about the term over the last few years, but there's 
plenty of people who have been in the data science field and have actually used the term data science for 30, 40, 50 years. And a lot of those people come from the world of computer science and from statistics. And what's happened with the advent of computers, like we heard from the earlier speaker, um, that computers have changed everything with uh, you know, personal computers and iPhones and all that kind of stuff, where you now have a lot of data available to you. And so what's happened is that data science and computer science and statistics have started to come together in a much more significant way than they had in the past. And now you have the opportunity to get to a lot of data. So it's not just big data, but it's accessible data. And it can be small data sets, it can be large data sets, but it's now accessible to you. And you can use mathematical principles, statistical principles, computer science to understand what's in the data, to display it, uh, and to make decisions. And I actually have a slightly different view, uh, just in general, about data science. I think it's the whole package. It's everything. It's not just the people at the end of the line who are looking at the data and making a decision. Those aren't the data science people. The data science people are the people all along the way who are involved in collecting the data, in storing the data, building the systems to store the data, building the platforms and the processes to deal with the data, being able to retrieve the data and look at the data. All of those people are data scientists as well. And then you get to the people towards the end, which is typically where, more where I sit anyway, and that is analyzing the data and looking at it to make insights and decisions. Um, and so I think, but I think the whole package, all of these people are data scientists and people have an opportunity to find out where they, which part of the process fits for them. Some people like to be at the very beginning where they're more involved in the computer side. Some people like to be uh, in the middle where they're managing the databases and making sure that things are running smoothly. And some people like to be at the end where they're making decisions and looking at the data and making sort of actionable decisions that have an impact on the company. But you can't do it without everybody. So all of those people I think are all part of the data science team. They're just different parts. Where I work at Alchemy is it's a pharmaceutical company. Uh, and before that, for many years, I was at Merck, another pharmaceutical company. And I work in the area where we design clinical trials to test our drugs. So we're uh, groups of statisticians that design the studies uh, with the help of our colleagues at the medical group to uh, look at the drugs that the company has to see if they're safe and effective. So we collect the data, bring it in, and try to do it in an efficient way uh, so that we can get to the data as quickly as possible and determine either that the drug works and it's safe and get it to the regulators across the world to get it approved so it can be on the market and help people. Or the flip side, if it doesn't work or it's not safe, we find that out as quickly as possible and abandon that product and go to something else, spend our time working on drugs that do work. So uh, we spend a lot of time collecting, designing uh, studies that collect data, looking at the data, reviewing it, and then uh, hopefully going to the regulators to get our drugs approved. All right, thanks. Lewa? Okay, so I guess that's the last speaker. There's a lot of challenge. I don't disagree with many people have said already. Um, I think instead of maybe rehashing what everybody has already said, I want to uh, maybe offer some slightly, I know we, I agree with everyone, data science is everything we do. Actually, when we go to Amazon searching a product, we are data scientists too. You don't have to worry a scientist title. But I think why we're talking about data science today, not maybe 10 years ago, right? There's something happened. So I think two things happened. In the bio world, number one thing is we have the capability to generate really high quality and very large amount of data. NGS is one example, but there are other examples too. So 10 years ago, we don't have the capability to generate such a high quality, large amount of data. So many of the you know, practice we need today, 10 years ago, we couldn't use them. That's one thing. The other thing Jason, I think, spent most of his time talking about is the infrastructure. Once you have the data, there's a lot of technologies we use today. Actually, for example, artificial neural network is something more than 30, maybe 40 years old, right? People in the 80s are doing that. Why today suddenly produce a lot of product and excitement is the infrastructure allow us to go much deeper, much larger scale. So I think if you think from that particular point of view, number one, I do agree with everyone. Data science has to focus on the questions, focus on generating insight, testing hypothesis, and most importantly, also creating very creative solutions. Because many of the challenges we do by using traditional method that they don't really give us a different solution we may make incremental 
improvement, but data science actually would give us. I don't know how many of you are Go players. I'm not, but I, I'm a Chinese, so I'm very familiar with it. Many of you probably have heard about AlphaGo, right? So if you pay attention to that, what AlphaGo eventually um, gave this Go community is AlphaGo come up with the solution. Even the best master of Go player couldn't think of why AlphaGo is making decisions that way. So I think data science can offer some very unique solutions when our traditional method wouldn't be able to do it. So that would be the area I think for us maybe playing a leadership role in our organization we can pay attention to. Um, so that's kind of my maybe in addition to everyone. I do agree with what everyone has already said. And in terms of the uh, data science role within H3, H3 is an oncology drug discovery and early development company. And uh, in terms of the role we play, we play two roles. Number one, data science is a business scientific partner with the rest of the department. So it's not a technology supporting department, making sure people know how to work with the data, but we actually really use data generating scientific input together with every other discipline. The other part we play is that, I agree again with John and Jerry, is that we have a big responsibility to actually democratize data. So data science and the data should not, should not be metabolized by the data scientist. Everyone is a data scientist. And how do we enable everyone become a very effective data scientist? Is we have to build infrastructure, software, tools, data access portals where every scientist can spend their time asking scientific questions rather than trying to be friend with a data scientist or trying to make sure their request is a priority that can be addressed in a timely fashion. So I think that's my maybe expanded definition. So when someone says everybody's a data scientist, do the data scientists feel the same way about that as writers feel when they say everyone's a writer? Because the writers are like, mm. no, that's not true. So what, maybe we can talk about that. So before we go further, um, we have tweeted this out, so you may have seen it, but we are using Slido to um, crowdsource and upvote questions. So I've got five already. Um, We've got a few more things we're going to talk about before we get into these, but please, uh, you don't even need to log in. Just go there, slider.com, put in B117, and type in a question. You don't need to log in. You don't need an account. Um, you can add your own question. You can read what's there and upvote the ones that you would like us to prioritize. Um, I expect us to have lots of questions, so I'm hoping that we can kind of um, organize them this way. and. When we don't get to them all, then we can field more at the Meet the Experts booth. So go ahead and check that out. Somebody, some wonderful person, seeded our question pile last night at 1127. So if everyone's anonymous on here, if you want to raise your hand, I'll give you a golden ticket. If you want to admit to having been giving me questions at 1127, <laughs> no takers. All right, well, your Me. questions. It was you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you planted yourself. That kind of makes it different since it's your own <laughs> panel. Um, but yeah, keep an eye on that while we're talking and, and vote for questions that you want us to prioritize um, that will help us best use all of our time. But before we get into these, another thing that came up in our conversation was some surprising applications of data science. Um, because we've talked about what we think all of, all of us separately, think data science is, and then what maybe the company might think it is sort of separately. So we talked about some surprising applications in everyone's role um, that people might not normally think of when they think of data science. So you want to go through those? Does anybody want to start? I want to jump in. Tanya, we'll start. I, yeah. Awesome. Um, so a surprising application? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know that this is necessarily surprising, just maybe surprisingly useful because uh, as far as I know, there aren't many pharma companies currently implementing this type of solution. So uh, working with a drug manufacturing group at a major pharma company, uh, they had basically, um, you know, when you're creating drug substances from uh, raw materials to biologic or finished drug substance, there's a whole kind of genealogy and process. And there's a lot of different uh, substances that go into making these drugs. And so there's really like a, it's like a massive recipe. And if one substance is problematic, that can be a huge issue. Number one, you have to shut down manufacturing. That's a ton of money and time wasted. And then you have to go back and find the problematic substance and also all of the batches that are potentially corrupt. 
Uh, and so uh, these incidents, they have to be reported to the FDA. Not all of them are. It happens a lot more than we think. Um, but essentially what this group was doing before when this would happen is they would cease production and then they would have to go in and manually write SQL queries to go through and find every single you know, substance that was involved with this substance. And so what we built for them was uh, leveraging the database and structuring the data properly uh, an interactive kind of visual way. So you could click and you, it's almost like, um, you know, you're able to flow through, uh, if you could picture like a force directed chart. And now instead of six months and a team of five or so to identify this substance, it's about one person in half a day. And so that's huge. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really like a, an insurance policy that you're buying. So I don't think many people think about, this is, a, I, I think, a simple application. Uh, so I've done you know, the causal modeling, Bayesian network, cancer genomics, and that stuff is, I think, very difficult. This stuff is like just thinking with common sense about your data and how can I optimize processes like this. Excellent. Who else? John. Okay. Um, I'd say one thing that I would say is probably most surprising uh, at, at Alexion was y you, th you think, okay, data sciences, there'll be all these applications in discovery and research, and certainly there are, but what we're finding is an amazing set of applications in strategy, in business development, in commercial. And so it's been very exciting at Alexion just seeing the broad impact of data sciences. If I had to sort of uh, pick one that was really intriguing. It, it was an unexpected use of a capability that we built. It started with the CEO asking me three years ago, hey, hey, Reinders, how many rare diseases are there? It's a devilishly simple question with a very complex answer. You pull together all of Orphanet and GHR and OMIM and resolve you know, all these different um, nuances, how they're uh, referenced, how they reference each other, you know, 20 cases to you know, 20 per million. Um, we also wanted to understand about each of these diseases. What's the prevalence? Um, what's the onset? What's the phenotype? What are all the clinical presentations? So all of uh, um, uh, uh, all of uh, um, uh, HPO, all of uh, SNOMED CT, having that all in there as well. What are all the interventions? What's the underlying uh, genes? What are the underlying uh, systems biology features? So we had this up and running, answering all sorts of interesting questions, uh, disease landscapes, you know, opportunity sets. Um, then we had kind of uh, you know an interesting sort of aha moment, and the serendipity was, and I have a prop. I don't know if any of you have seen this. Um, oh golly, I accidentally turned it on. It's going to make all sorts of noise now. Um, so this is a. Uh, I got to turn it off. Well, oh well, it'll be buzzing throughout. This is, a, this is a little ball that plays 20 questions with you. And it's rather striking. Um, I do want to turn it off because it will start making lots of noise. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> So you, you'll, you'll play 20 questions, and it's kind of funny, and, and it, at 16 or 17, it seems to go off the rails, and then at 20, it like nails it. You're like, huh, that was interesting. And then you start throwing really hard things at it. Dream, it gets it. Unicorn, no problem. Snowball, easy. So we had to figure out how this thing worked, right? <laughs> so we looked it up, and actually, it was a company that open sourced uh, or crowdsourced online on a website, the game 20 Questions. Um, and looked at every possible answer and took all of that crowdsourced knowledge of you know, hundreds of uh, people years of, of insight and built a neural network and burned it into the chip. So that when you're playing that game, you're actually playing with like all these people that have played for this period of time. And so what we got to think at, at Alexion is, wait a second, we just built this huge data graph that connects every clinical phenotype and feature to every rare disease. Why can't we play 20 questions with that? So, hmm. so doctor, you've seen these three you know, clinical features before. Do you also see this one? It's the same thing that Amazon does, right? You bought these three things before. Do you want this? Yeah, I really do, right? Same thing here. Do you see this? No, I don't. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And you've got Bayesian uh, approaches under the hood, machine learning, that's helping to figure out what is the very best next question to ask that prunes the tree, creates more differential diagnosis, and most importantly, helps accelerate an understanding of, of the patient's disease. We just announced actually a really exciting collaboration with Boston Children where we're trying to figure out how best to deploy this. Uh, ideas about how do you triage incoming patients, how do you build a, a chat bot to work with a, um, with an, you know, a, 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 disease, you know, a rare disease community group. So that, I'd say, is probably our most surprising application. Uh, it's what's pastor say, is uh, chance favors the prepared mind. Always be prepared in data sciences. It's really surprising what your tools might do. Yeah, I love that. The best next question. That's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's applicable. All kinds of 
situations. Jerry? Okay, well my, my example is a little bit different and this, the space that I work in is clinical trials and testing drugs. Um, and I've, like I said before, I've been at Merck a long time, so here's an example from Merck, how people in the data science area of the company, Merck's a big company, and you might think, well, how can we have much of an impact on what happens to the company? You know, it's 60,000 people, and the data science people are just a small fraction of that, and it's driven by, you know, physicians and business people and scientists. Uh, but we really have a huge impact to make. And I go back a few years, um, I just left Merck last year, but go back a few years, back to 2007, and we were then having conversations about using adaptive clinical trials, which were not very popular in 2007. If any of you were in the business in 2007, remember what the world was like, but what people were starting to do is do very complicated adaptive trials. And what we proposed at Merck is that rather than do one or two very sophisticated, very complicated trials per year, what we wanted to do is build a platform that could handle many adaptive trials simultaneously for the company. So potentially anywhere from zero to 100% of all of Merck clinical trials could be adaptive which in 2007 was not the standard approach for adaptive designs. And so we proposed it to the company, they accepted it, and we started building a platform. Now in order to do that, you have to be able to collect the data and bring it in from the sites. You know, our studies are done all around the world, uh, clinical trials all around the world, and bring the data in to some central repository in the cloud somewhere. So we don't need to know where the computer is. We just need to know that there is some storage facility somewhere that is holding the data that we can get to. And then make sure the data is usable, clean it up, uh, and then be able to display it, access it, display it, analyze it, get the information out of it, and then if we want to make a change to the trial, then we can implement that. So all of these different people from different parts of the organization in the data science world, even in the clinical world, have to all work together. It's kind of like a NASCAR pit crew, uh, where everybody has their role, it has to be done in real time, has to be done fast. And if you do it for one study, you put a special team together and they can do it for one study. If you do it for 10 studies, it's a little bit harder. If you do it for 50 studies, it's harder. If you do it for 200, studies, it's even harder. So you have to make sure that the whole process works, all the people work together. So we proposed this in 2007, we started implementing it back then, and by 2009 we were in production. Uh, as a sort of a good idea, we thought it made sense for the company. We were talking about adaptive clinical trials. And then in the Merck world, along came this drug called pembrolizumab, which I'm sure many people have heard about, uh, which is immuno-oncology product, a PD-1 inhibitor uh, for uh, cancer that seems to work in many tumors. Our original development program for Pembro was to do just a couple of studies, see what happens, and then try it in multiple tumor types and see if we got a response. And our management said, no, you have to do it in as many tumor types as you can. So we went from a very, very small program to a very, very large program with dozens and dozens of clinical trials, and it ramped up very fast. Almost all of them were done adaptively. And you, you can think if, you, if we didn't have this system, it might have broken the, the back of the data group to be able to handle the data, get the data in, and get it and process it, make changes. Because every study we did, you know, studies in, as people know now, studies in melanoma and breast cancer and head and neck and lung cancer. So we had all different tumor types. The data were coming in. We had designed hundreds of clinical trials in about a couple, one or two or three years. We went from zero to several hundred clinical trials. I think now there must be four or five, six hundred clinical trials ongoing with Keytruda. Uh, and what we did is we built this platform to bring the data in, analyze it, look at it, visualize the data, make decisions. Every study was unique, every study was different, and get back out there and change the study if we needed to and then go on and do the next one. And it's sort of one of these untold stories in the background that, you know, Keytruda now is a big success for Merck, uh, selling something like $6 billion uh, in sales a year, and it's helping people because it's actually making a difference in how they, their tumors respond. And many of these tumors are going away, and the people are, you know, almost being cured of cancer for the first time. Uh, so it's having a big impact and hopefully will continue to have a big impact. I don't work in Merck anymore, <laughs> but uh, it's still ha having an impact on savings people's lives. And mm. the people in the data science group at Merck 
enabled the company to go from a very small program to a very large program that was done all adaptively in a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge uh, accomplishment for the, the people at Merck. And as John was saying, it's one of those things, we set it up in advance. Mm -hmm. We set up this process without knowing that Keytruda was going to need it. And we set it up about two years before Keytruda. We were doing it for other studies. And then once we had, you know, so you can't wait until you have the problem at, your, at hand. You have to do things that make sense when you're at the, at the initial time and plan for the future. And so we set this process up and we were able to look at the data and make sense out of the data and modify our clinical trials and catch up. So the story with Keytruda is it started out several years behind the competition, another pharma company. And we were able, because we went broad and fast and were able to look at the data quickly, we were actually able to accelerate the Keytruda program faster than a comp competition and eventually pass them. So over the last you know, seven, eight, it's only been since 2010, 2011. So it's been you know, seven, eight years of development. It's gone from a very small program to a marketed drug with many indications and a lot, a lot of success. And we were able to pass some of the other competitors in the space. A lot of it, you know, there, there are a lot of people involved, a lot of very smart physicians and other people in the company, but the data science group played a key role at Merck. Okay, so I think I can uh, offer you an example, maybe echo the point I was making before, is when you have data as so-called the big data scale, there are certain questions, certain solutions you can ask when you don't have it. Um, so it's open um, knowledge that H3 Biomedicine has a collaboration with Foundation Medicine, also in Cambridge. They are a diagnostic company using the targeted next entry sequencing panel, testing cancer patient and using that information to inform clinical uh, clinicians' decision making. So that was the original purpose, but because they are testing patients constantly of them coming to the clinic, and what happened is that their data actually turns out to be almost like an evolutionary history of cancer genomics. So for some of you, either you're familiar or not, that cancer genomic has a very interesting characteristic. It's always evolving. It's not a static. So it's actually shaped by what is the standard care we give to the patient. And they develop resistant mechanisms. So they change, they mutate, they change the cellular state. And because foundation data is in such a um, large volume, so if you look at their Q1, 2018 financial results and the conversation their CEO had with investors, he's predicting they are going to have about 90 to 100,000 patients uh, sequenced this year. So what we have been collaborating with them for about two or three years so far, and what we were able to do with that data, because we were talking about hundreds and thousands of data, uh, patient data, not 10,000 or a few hundred, is we were able to watch individual mutation in terms of their time course. So what mutation are arising in frequency? And if that mutation is arising in frequency, can you correlate what are the new therapies are introduced in that disease and the prescription pattern? Would that inform you what this mutation is doing in terms of creating resistant mechanism to the standard of care therapy? So that can really inform you what, what would be the next generation target you want to introduce in that particular patient population to help uh, fight the resistance. So that's kind of an interesting, um, by itself, you don't need a very complicated statistical approach or machine learning. You just need to know, be able to draw the time frequency. But that's an opportunity you can only do when you have a, such a very large, very high quality and ever evolving data because the, the patients are coming to the clinic like, all the time. So their data is actually a live snapshot of the patient genomic in the clinics. So I think that's the, the example I want to give in terms of what big data give you a unique opportunity. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so everyone knows how to work Slido, good job. Um, we have 34 questions. <laughs> so I wanna point out a couple things. First of all, after we are done here, um, these lovely people will be at the Meet the Experts booth, which is in the 600 aisle toward our end of the expo hall. So when we inevitably do not get through all these questions, you can go chat with them there. The very first question is, how do you build an effective data science team? And I want us to answer that, but not right now, um, because I'm afraid that would take up the rest of our time. So I do want you all to note that tomorrow in the bioinformatics track at around 11, at 11 o'clock, there is a panel dedicated to hiring the team. 
Um, so I do want to get y'all's takes on that, but I also want everyone to note that we've got a dedicated panel to that. Don't you love it when you ask a question, we've already answered it? <laughs> we've already scheduled a time to answer it, rather. It's a great panel, so um, I hope I will be there. I hope I will see you there as well. Uh, so we're going to go to the next most voted question. Um, ooh, this one's kind of calling me out. Scientists are very protective of their data, said the writer, who just was annoyed that everyone thinks they can write. Can you share how to engage a culture that removes data silos and encourages data sharing? <laughs> so anyone can jump in. We don't need to go in a row. Um, maybe I can start. All right. I, I think we have a little bit of advantage because I joined H3 when the company just started uh, scientific operations. So we haven't had a existing culture or some fixed mindset. And I was joining them as the director of mathematics. So in the very beginning, we had the culture to say we have to use data to make our scientific conversation and decision. And our data science team does spend a lot of time, as I mentioned before, to so-called democratize data. We do make the data very much accessible from a genomics point of view to the rest of the company. We also build a collaboration platform. We encourage people to actually publish their scientific results as they work through it. People don't want to make a fool of themselves. They don't feel comfortable if they haven't looked at their slides, look at their conclusion. But you know, in the very, very beginning from you know, day, everyday project discussion to maybe uh, you know, management team scientific discussion, we actually have countless examples. People pull out our data portal, show the data, and have the very heated conversation. So I think that just in the very beginning, we show people that it's really OK because we're talking about science. And we have many, many examples through daily projects, through scientific meeting, to just really encourage that. I think while, while we're building the team, people kind of bought into the culture and go along with that. So I think we do have a bit of advantage, but I think making data very, very accessible, allow people to do live discussion is very important that you just really show that is the most productive way of actually making scientific conversation. Yeah. And I, and I can add, uh, cause I, I think when you start about sharing data, it's really a two-way street, that there's the person who wants to see the data who didn't create it or wasn't part of the process that created it, and the person who made the data, uh, or they didn't make it up, but they, they did the experiment or they collected the data somehow. So they have access to the data, and other people want it. Uh, and what happens is that th there's responsibility on both sides. And the person who wants to get access to the data, and I've seen this happen in small companies and big companies, sometimes they'll see something and they want to be the one, and it's interesting how people are because it's almost uh, like when we're little kids, but they want to be the one to show the boss the results. And so the person who did the experiment says, well, it's my experiment. I want to show the boss, whoever the boss is. Could be the, the CEO, could be the vice president. But to the, show the, the more senior people the result. The person who did the experiment feels it's their data. They should show the senior management the results. And so you have to make it clear that if somebody else is accessing the data, it's not just who can get to the CEO first. And, that, and you don't play that game. And so people who play that game should not be given access to the data, because that's the wrong use of the data. It's the same thing, and I've seen this happen, where because where I say usually in the, you know, the statistics group and data management program <coughs> groups, we have the data. So we have the, all the data from all the clinical trials. So everyone wants to get to the data. Uh, and I've seen uh, people who were well-meaning, but they will pull data out uh, and then write a paper and submit the paper on their own. So that's also irresponsible. So it goes both ways. So once you make it clear to people what responsible activities are, you give them early access to the data, but you say that you have some responsibilities to use it properly. And, and I've found over the years that giving people access to data and sharing the results of experiments, whether they're small experiments or larger studies or uh, even bigger clinical trials or even data from outside other sources, that people benefit from that. But they have to accept it with responsibility. And so the responsibility of what people do with it goes together. And they have to demonstrate that they are responsible users of the data. Uh, so you don't just say, here's all the data, do whatever you want with it. But the process continues. And the relationship between all the people who access the data and the people who did the original experiment continues. And it's not just, give me the data, I'll do whatever I want. 
to do with it, which is what some people want to do, and they don't get access to the data. But it's give me access to the data and let's work together. And the people who say let's work together to understand it are the people who get access to the data. So I think there's a way to do it, but there's responsibilities on both sides to uh, make it uh, more, more productive, more efficient. And really, the, the goal is to understand what's going on inside the data, what the insights, what the messages are that they can give you. So it's reversing the order today. Okay. <laughs> so um, actually, I, I share with you sort of a simple principle that I've, I've found just different companies I've worked at you know, over the years you know, really helps with, with people sharing data, is it, it takes some amount of effort. The person that's created the data, they've got lots of work to do. And here you come knocking on the door saying, please share it. Put it into this system or this environment and whatever it might be. If you make it so that when this colleague places their data in that environment, they're able to get more out of their data. They can generate more insight. Wow, look at all these analytics I can do. Look at all this visualization. Oh, look at all this other data it's connected with. It creates this natural desire then. If, I, if I've created data and I want to get the most out of it, I do want to put it in this environment where it's shared mm -hmm. because look at everything that I get back. So creating environments that can uh, motivate your colleagues to place their data there because they get more out of their data, that I find typically accelerates sharing. Yeah, and I, I, I just agree with all of that. To add to, I think, Liwa's point, I like that she mentioned accessibility. Obviously, the more accessible the data, the more people will be able to use it, but also encouraging that culture of share your code, share your data. It's, it's tough, because working at several companies and startups, I mean, some places, everyone's very secretive. I think it's because they're scared of that accountability or making mistakes, but we're human. You're going to make mistakes in your code. It's fine to do code reviews together, uh, but you have to lead by example sometimes by putting your data out there first and be the person to put your code up on a projector even. Um, so I think that's, that's another way. But the other one is fostering this innovative culture. And I, I always try to set up like playground sandboxes at companies to encourage data scientists to play. And so I think that's a great idea too, is if you put your data here, look what you can build, but also look at all the other data we can integrate with it. So is building a sandbox and encouraging play, um, is that counterintuitive or against the idea of you need to have a question? Yeah, so I, that's a huge point of data science, I think, is we have to have the question, of course, to start with. And I think you can't hire a data scientist and say, just go play, because you'll probably produce nothing useful. Or you, you need to have uh, clear, directed questions and hypotheses to test. Because I know, I've done it myself, you can get very lost in the weeds quickly if you don't keep reminding yourself, like, what is, if I were to put a name on this product and sell it on a shelf, what would it be? Um, so keep reminding yourself of that. But I think you also need to innovate. So allocate 10% you know, of your data scientist time to playing and innovating so that you can stay ahead and just, it's fun for them too, it'll keep talent, but try to give them as dire much direction as possible, of course. Um, you should have like a three, six month kind of goal set up for your data scientists when they get onboarded or they're gonna flounder and just get lost. I want to build on top of what John and Jerry has said regarding the infrastructure, the, the culture aspect. So uh, I think one part of it is we try to have our data governance, data practice, or in infrastructure to really facilitate the data generator to make their data accessible. If it's extra burden, you're too busy, that's probably not going to comply. And the other part of it is actually, I don't think the data generator owns the data. It's the company scientific data. So that's part of our data practice. Data needs to go to a data management system and accessible to all the scientists. So the CEO doesn't have a privilege as the only one seeing the data or you know, buying certain privileges that is really available to everyone. So that also in some way can address this culture issue. Certain people have the privilege to you know, connecting to certain other people because it's really flatly accessible to everyone. All right, so we've got um, a question here that came up in our conversation as well. So the question on Slido is opinions on free, open source, versus commercial analytics. And then we had discussed this build versus buy. Um, how much of your data science happens inside of your organization? Which parts do you bring in vendors for? Which parts do you, um, do you take care of consultants? Um, do you take care of yourself? How does that work? Sort of how do you make choices among your tools? Well, I can start with that. Uh, having worked with a lot of open source and at companies that open sourced products, um, it really depends on the skill set of your engineers and the size of your team. So while you could set up your own Hadoop cluster and Spark and um, you know Apache 
if you're using Kafka or all of these tools, you can. It's possible with engineers that have DevOps expertise, but uh, if you don't, you may want to go with one of the commercial vendor solutions. Now, that's for, for tools. Um, it's, there are a lot of maintenance, and so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, I had a client uh, build an on-prem Hadoop cluster and just wasn't ready for it, so they did end up bringing on some outside help to help them maintain the cluster. We gave them the warning, but you know, sometimes people, they were very uh, scared of the cloud, which we can probably talk about at some point. Like, there's a stigma still. Uh, I honestly trust AWS's security more than a lot of people's on-prem clusters, um, depending on the competency of your security engineers. But, uh, uh, sorry, now I'm losing my, my train of thought. It was the... Uh, well, build versus buy. Open yes, versus oh, solution. so, but in terms of build versus buy, in, term, like, in terms of large solutions, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of my clients would like that knowledge in-house. So if you outsource too much to a vendor, you lose some of that that you could be gaining. And when they leave, you might lose some, some of that knowledge. But, uh, so it's a tough decision that you, you sometimes have to make. And a lot of times it's um, timeline dependent. We need a quick win. Uh, can you train our scientists though on what you did and then leave? Yeah. So um, Alexion, we actually have a pretty lean uh, data sciences team. It's like about six or seven individuals. And we deliver quite a bit because we have a pretty large ecosystem of partners that we work through. We're pretty impressed with uh, capabilities, whether it's you know, partners that can manage you know, entire clouds, whether it's partners that are very sophisticated in terms of mathematics or statistical methods. We focus the internal team on what's the question, how do you frame it, how do you prototype it, how do you demonstrate. And then we work with partners to actually flesh it out and, uh, and build you know, all the different components of it. Um, the other thing that you get working through partners that we find is very valuable is, you know, one problem you're working on, you need an expert in genetic algorithms. Next day it's forests. The day after that it's self-organizing maps. To try and build an internal team that has all those expertise that doesn't come quickly obsolete in terms of the next set of questions you need to pursue, I think is challenging. We've, we've actually been very successful with a lean, very high caliber internal team and an, an excellent set of partners that we work with to maintain agility in terms of the different questions we seek to answer. All right, we've got so much good stuff here. We are not going to be able to get to all of it. Um, so where was that one? OK, so here's a question about communicating. How do you overcome the issues of communicating complicated multi-omic statistical analysis to clinicians so that they can be effective? And then down lower. Um, we use interpretive dance. That helps. <laughs> I love that. I want to see, I want to see that. Can you, can you show us? <laughs> <laughs> Similarly, someone said, can you democratize medicine so that everyone can be a doctor? <laughs> no. I don't think so, right? I don't okay. think so. Not all the way. I don't think even the best dance is going to do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will address the, the genomic question. Um, I actually put something on my door when the data scientists walk into my door and other people walk into my door. I want them to read it. Um, I think somebody said is said by Einstein, I'm not so sure that's true or not, but I just put it on my door, is that if you cannot explain it simply, you do not understand it deeply. So, um, <laughs> because well, sometimes data scientists have such a complicated training, and it's almost inhibited for non-data scientists to <laughs> ask them questions because they may feel it's really uninformed or not well-educated questions. So two things we emphasize a lot in terms of skill set or you know the work quality are two sides. So I've, I view the data scientist work has three components. And typically, most people focus on the middle part, which is the technology, the algorithm, the how I'm going to process my NGS data. But there are actually, that's only one third of the work. The one big part of the work in the beginning is how do you communicate with your partner in terms of deeply understand what is the real question? What are you really trying to understand, address using data, right? So if you truly understand that, you will be able to cut through the chase, choosing the most appropriate technology that may be the simplest. And then if you truly are a good state scientist, you should be able to understand what is hypothesis or what is the assumption of the technology you are using to address the question. And once the question came out, I, you know, definitely in my team, I would discourage people giving scientists a spreadsheet of 500 genes, figure out what's going on. So we really ask them to go back to the original question to say, how my data are addressing the questions, 
right? Did I answer the question? Did I generate some surprising counterintuitive hypothesis? Or is there something wrong with the data, with the hypothesis, with what we did, right? And so that's the communication. They have to be able to frame the question in terms of the original scientific question, and they have to be able to digest the results to the point to say, I did answer the question, here's the evidence, and here's how I did it to answer the question. So really, um, leaving the technical weeds out in the communication, but be fully prepared to answer the technical question when the scientists are asking questions are challenging the approaches. And that is the best moment for data scientists to actually learn. You're not just doing how to do it, you're really doing why you're doing it. So I think really emphasizing the beginning and the end part of it. And we tend to overemphasize the middle part of it. So I think that's kind of our experience. That's it? Nobody else wants to tackle that one? Well, I think it's a, <laughs> it's a good point. And I think people sometimes get bogged down in the formula and the algorithm. Mm -hmm. And when you're explaining it to someone else, which is exactly what you said, it's not the formula that you used, that you used as the explanation, but why did you use that formula and what was underlying it? And you're exactly right. People who understand what they're doing, people who, who, who all they know is to run a formula or run a program or run an algorithm, that's all they can talk about because they say, oh, I ran this. And, and I've asked people, why did you pick this value to, to represent what's going on in your data? And they said, well, that's what they always do. Everybody looks at that value. And I say, well, what does it tell you? And really, what you need to know is why did you do it? What's going on? What is it measuring? What is it looking at? And why is it appropriate for the situation that you're in? It's not just, can you run this program? And a lot of times, people are so busy, all they do is they push buttons and not quite that you know, rough away, but they, they just run the program. They know it's the right program. They know that they've got the data. They know the output is correct, but they're not really sure what's going on inside. And you really have to understand what's going on inside because the medical people, if you're trying to talk to a physician, they don't care that you ran a program. And they don't care that you took a field from a particular output to interpret what happened in the study. What they want to know is why did you do it and what, what's going on. So you really have to know what did the program do and why, did, why was the, the mathematics used, uh, why did you pick the mathematics in a certain way and use it in a certain way in this example rather than another approach. And so exactly right, you have to really understand it. And a a lot of people just get bogged down in, here's the program I ran, and I can explain the program, but they can't explain deeply what went on inside the program. So <clears throat> completely agree with the omics answers. I did want to make sure we kind of got to the doctor question. Um, yeah. <clears throat> what I would note is um, all four of our definitions actually had the word insight in it. And I think one of the things that's foundational to data science is it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a person asking the question and it's human insight that's being accelerated. I, you know, I'd be very, very hesitant to assert data science is down the road in some you know, um, Skynet became self-aware kind of future. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's always going to be enabling insight. And any doctor that's treating me or my, my daughters, thank you very much, I want that to be a human, but accelerated with data science's insight, you bet. Right. And I can talk about, I think, both of these, uh, the culture of communicating uh, properly. So it's, you talk differently to an executive than you would a scientist, same with a clinician or a physicist. So I think it's about speaking their language. I wouldn't even say the words principal components analysis to an executive. And typically, executives want to see the results first. They don't really care about how you got there. Uh, they don't care about the details of your random forest. They could give two craps, right? And some people, scientists especially, want to be led up to your results. They need to see the proof and the, uh, the pr you know, the um, proofs in the pudding, right? They need to see your data and your assumptions that were made. And uh, so you have to know your audience. Are they dealing with? Uh, deductive reasoner or do they want to see the results right away? Uh, so that's one way that I try to get around those issues. Um, and the other with democratizing, was it everyone could be a doctor? <laughs> I, I don't know about that, but I think that we're taking more charge of our, our personal health care. You know, there's mm -hmm. companies like Patients Like Me, uh, 23andMe, you can do your own genetic testing. Uh, I brought my genetic report to my doctor she kind of didn't really want to do anything with it, but I know certain things now about myself, mm -hmm. so I think that we are taking more control over, over our own data, and we will, may not all be doctors, but we, can, we have to be in charge of our own health to some extent using yeah. data. Um, so here's, I feel like this is kind of a chicken and the egg question. How do you get clean data 
and bring the SMEs into the conversation about what questions to ask. But in the process of cleaning the data, aren't you already steering what questions you want to ask? I don't know. Y'all tell me. So maybe another way to uh, think about it, I mean, John and I actually overlapped a few years in AZ, so we've probably seen how much we have to clean the data when we're talking <laughs> about the translational you know, platform. Um, I think if you are facing the question of cleaning the data, you're a little bit late. So if you have the right data management governance practice, the data should come out of the experiment, goes into the right database with the proper control, with the proper metadata. And with the eye towards, they will be used, they will be integrated downstream. So if you do it that way, your task is not about cleaning the data. Your task is about every day managing, governing your data properly. Then you'll spend your effort later on on actually looking the data, generating insight, testing hypothesis. So if you don't pay any attention to data governance, only when you have the question, you come here to say, I have a mess, let me clean the data, that's a little bit late. And, and there's actually a question inside your question uh, that's sort of implied, and that is, and it's an interesting one, I wonder what the other people here might think, and that is, when do you ask the question? Do you ask the yeah. question after you have the data, or do you ask the question before you have the data and the design an experiment, or in my case, clinical trial, which is essentially an experiment, to collect data to answer that question? And it's very different, and, it, and the worlds are very different. What some people do is they look at data they already have, and then they ask questions, but when you think about it, and it's back to the chicken and the egg thing, if you're already looking at the data, you, you're asking questions because you see the answers. So you're, already, you're asking questions that are already answerable, even if you say, well, I didn't look, or I, I didn't notice, but the answer's are already there. So you're, you're sort of, you're picking the questions, it's like you know, Jeopardy backwards, I guess. You're sort of looking at the answers and then picking the questions after, after you've already seen the answers. And my view of doing an experiment is coming up with a question that you want to evaluate, and then designing an experiment to test that question, what, however you want to do it, and then go out and collect the data that would answer that question. And then, as a matter of, for cleaning the data, you have some process in place to make sure that the data makes sense. Uh, you know, in my case, in a pharma company, a data management group that would actually clean the data. But the question was asked before you collect, before you do the experiment, before you write the protocol for the clinical trial. Mm -hmm. And you don't look at the data and then ask the question because then you're gonna be misleading yourself. And sometimes people will do that. And there's some question about whether that's appropriate to do in certain cases uh, or any cases. You know, actually, I think there's a question within your question within the question. <laughs> uh, so, Another level. Yeah. Um, so, Actually, one thing that I find is really important with data sciences is even before you get to the data cleaning, even before you get to the experiment, I would say is the art of the possible, is helping colleagues know about questions they didn't even know they could ask. Or they couldn't ask last year, but we yeah. can't ask now. So I think that's one of the big remits of any data sciences group. I mean, we have an incredible toolbox at our disposal, and a lot of our work and a lot of our efforts, certainly at Lexon, is these wonderful discussions with colleagues saying, hey, did you know, actually, that's an answerable question? <gasps> really? Let's do that. So I think, actually, that's the very, very first step, is not asking the question, but helping colleagues know what questions they can ask. And I think everyone, at some point, it, in the near future or now, is going to have to be hands-on with data. So I, I think I look at it like email, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago. Everyone uses it now. Everyone's going to have to be hands-on with data. I don't care if you're executive or entry level, but there's all so many tools being built that enable self-service analytics and uh, data wrangling tools, for example. Uh, there's companies like Trifacta who spun out of Stanford uh, for wrangling data. Anyone can now wrangle data and get access to data and join it. And I think the more people are empowered within an organization, the more valuable all of your data science efforts are going to be. Because uh, if you only have one or two people you know, pulling data and they're, they're blocked by IT because they have to ask for a SQL poll, you're just, there's so much uh, wasted time there. All right, so we're gonna kind of shift and like stretch our legs. You can get up and stretch your legs if you need to. <laughs> What's the latest, and get your water. What's the latest technology that really impressed you? So kind of a softball, quick. What are you excited about besides that little blue thing? <laughs> that was pretty impressive. 
can we see what's not impress us? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what are you completely That's unimpressed great. by? <laughs> uh, two things. Uh, <laughs> we have great NGS technology for DNA, RNA, but we are very poor with proteomics. Um, I wish somebody who's a technical wizard can really work on that project. If we can measure protein as comprehensive, as accurate as how we measure DNA, RNA, that will push our you know, biology, our disease understanding to the next level. Yeah. The other one's EMR, EHR. I think, I don't know if there's anybody from those uh, health insurance companies. And the example I gave regarding correlating foundation medicine with EMR EHR data, that's part of it is dream because we don't really have EMR EHR data in such a high quality, easily accessible, analyzable way. I, uh, we're talking about what we're impressed with, not. Sorry, right? I didn't <laughs> answer the question. I, was, I answered the anti question. <laughs> she did unimpressed. I was, I was going to say, well, I, I guess I could do too. Uh, unimpressed. Uh, I hope not too many people from IBM are here, but Watson. Uh, <laughs> So I know that the, one of the value props that they do have is they do have a lot of data that they bring to the table on the healthcare side. However, it's very much a, still a consulting framework. They've done a really good job of marketing uh, this Jeopardy machine that can just answer all the questions like uh, his chatbot. But I'm uh, good. I'm good. <laughs> uh, impressed. Uh, I'm a huge R Studio fan. So everything that they're pumping out constantly is amazing, especially since it's open source. It enables me to run my business really well. And uh, I love Shiny because you're able to build interactive web applications, leveraging statistical modeling uh, capabilities of R. Uh, I was using R back when there was no R Studio in like 2005. And the f I was so jealous of these people that were using like D3 and the New York Times, he's here, uh, columnist, where they're creating really beautiful visualizations. And I thought, damn, I like went down the wrong track. <laughs> I have to learn all the job, all this Made job. wrong life choices. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I have to learn all this JavaScript. But now, I mean, with all the stuff, our, the R packages and our studio and Shiny, it's, uh, I'm able to bring my data science analysis to life and really show it to people. Uh, so I, I'm a big Shiny fan. Cool. I think something under the hood that, that I, I find really intriguing, because here we are writing these, you know, ANNs, all these, you know, techniques and are counting on a toolbox that's getting more powerful and faster, is some of what's happening in actually the hardware architecture. I mean, you look at mm -hmm. Google's, you know, second generation tensor processing unit. Yeah. And if you've got this systolic array fully loaded and pipelined, that sucker is pumping out 180 teraops, which is just astounding. And so you, if you start looking at sort of Turing equivalent type capabilities, whether it's the Intel FPGA capabilities where NVIDIA is going, yep. the TPU, actually the architecture is changing to more adapt to machine learning and AI. I just think all of a sudden we're just going to see this exponentiation in terms of, again, questions we didn't even know we could tackle. We'd be able to tackle with that kind of horsepower. Well, and I, I'm not sure what you said, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> at least for me, because <laughs> I'm not more, I'm not really on that side of the business. But um, if you look at the, so I'm still trying to figure that out. But if you still look at the uh, the data side, where I where I said it's sort of on the the interpret interpreting the data, not so much on the IT part. Uh, one of the fundamental things that's really changing in the pharmaceutical industry, and I think it's, it's a trend that's starting to happen now, and so we're in the early days and it's gonna explode, and that is the combination of clinical trial data and observational data, and it's starting to happen now, uh, and some companies are doing it. I know uh, Merck and Pfizer and a few other, the bigger companies are putting a huge amount of investment in that space, and I think what's gonna happen, you know, for those of us who, whose job it is to, you know, manage data within a pharmaceutical company to go from early human experience all the way through post-marketing and making sure that we have the right pharmacovigilance process in place. Being able to incorporate all the data together in one place and not have these silos and be able to get you know the things that we were talking about at the beginning, actionable insights and knowledge and displays of the data, that's gonna be huge. And it's already starting to happen at the big companies. It's gonna filter down to the smaller companies that aren't doing it now. And the ability to access insurance company data and EMR data, which may not be perfect mm -hmm. now, but uh, I'm always amazed that you can do it already. So you can see it happening. Uh, maybe 10 years or 20 years and our children, our grandchildren mm -hmm. will be working on systems that are much more efficient. We'll say, I remember when it was so hard to get to the data because it's the beginning, it's the early days. And the systems are not talking to each other perfectly and the formats don't match up perfectly. So you have a lot of problems, but you can see where we're going. 
and you can see the direction. And I actually think that that will actually help to make everybody become a physician so that you'll be able to know what happens to your drug when you take it. You know, you know, the thing that's troubling to me right now is the clinical trial experience, it's a small patient population. And the, what you wanna know is what happens when everybody takes this drug. And that information is starting to happen. It exists in a, little, in a small amount in different places. And bringing it all together, making it accessible, one of the things we were talking before, uh, so that everyone can look at it and you can see based on the subgroup that I am, uh, you know, white male this age, this, you know, living in the Boston area, I might have a different experience than a 20-year-old female in South America taking the same drug. So you might have some differences, and you, you'll be able to distinguish some of those things and learn about uh, those changes. So I think it's, it's really a huge opportunity that's starting to happen now. To me, it's very exciting from a data science perspective, because that's all data, and it's not clear how to interpret that whether you use a machine learning or artificial intelligence or some traditional inferential statistics methods or a combination of all three. But that's, we're really just on the verge of that. And I think over the next uh, few years, FDA is gonna re start requiring more of that. The EMA in Europe and uh, Japan and other countries are gonna start requiring that we integrate the clinical trial data and the observational data together. So it's, uh, it, yeah, to me, it's sure. one of the more exciting things that are going on today. Everyone get to answer? All right, we're gonna, can you answer? No, I thought he Sorry. answered my. Oh, he answered my question. Impressed. He's telling me. Right, it's I was actually impressed. Right, impressing right, right, right. going forward, so I'm okay. encouraged. With the okay, answer. so um, we're going to stretch our legs. I know there's some folks standing in the overflow room. This is your chance. Go find a seat. Um, so, you have yellow tickets. Again, this is the book. Um, and we're getting it early, about two weeks early, which is going to give you a head start on everyone else in the country. Um, it's a fantastic book. Carl Zimmer is a uh, best-selling author, New York Times writer and author. He's, um, I have read it because I got an even earlier copy and it is fantastic. It's so much fun. It's, um, so look now for your tickets. You have yellow tickets. Look for them. They're, they're on your desk. Is this like Oprah? You don't have to look hard. <laughs> <laughs> you get a book and you get a yeah. book and you get a book. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you've got them in the overflow room as well. They're under your seats in the overflow room. Here, if we put them under your seats, you would hey, see no, them. When you get some? This is so Oprah. This you is want so some? cool. <laughs> you know what? Look under your seats. I'm not much here. A car. Here. Cars and for everyone. You. They did not pay <laughs> anything in our seats. Yeah, we didn't get any. Yeah, where's our ticket? Yeah, <laughs> yeah where's our ticket? I know. I, I, I was <laughs> looking. Now she's actually going to get me one. <laughs> Y'all are such good sports. You get a ticket. <laughs> oh, we do have a ticket. And you get a ticket. Well, thank you. Uh, and you I get a ticket. Oh, good. And you get a ticket. Thank you. So, Carl Zimmer will be here tomorrow um, to give the plenary. Did we get some? Some people? Fun? Or no? Is that all a big joke? Oh, no. Good. Oh, there's 20 in this room, and I've seen five hands. So, check the empty seat. Oh, maybe six. Um, check the empty seat beside you. So, it's, uh, it's called She Has Her Mother's Laugh. It's about the power of perversions and potential heredity. And it's, um, there's a lot of cool history in here, if, if you like history. Um, he's talking about how we understood things to be passed on, how we know them to be passed on now, and how maybe we, aren't, we don't have a full picture of that yet, um, which I thought was really fascinating. So Carl will be here tomorrow to speak, and then he's signing books. If you have a yellow ticket, you have a book. That's how that's going to work. So that way... If we taped a book to the bottom of your seat, it would probably fall off. So we're giving you tickets instead. All right, is that all our housekeeping things for the break? Everyone find a seat in the overflow room? I hope. All right, y'all ready? Bring it. Ready. How do you hire a data science team? That's where we're going. Uh -oh. How do you build an effective data science team? And I've got some sub-questions under this. And where do you put the team? Do you put them in business? Do you put them in IT? <sighs> <clears throat> what are the pros and cons? Discuss amongst yourselves and us. We're going to all listen. Oh. I, I'll jump in because I, right. I mentioned already sort of the team architecture, just our <coughs> philosophy of keeping it very lean, very seasoned, very senior with, with a great set of external partners. Where you place it, that was actually a very strategic decision that Alexion made when I, when I first came in because it would have been very easy to say, let's put it in research because it makes sense. Gene expression arrays, systems biology, you know, Bayesian networks, looking for you know, targets and causal, you know, causal points in a node. It makes a lot of sense. But the head of R&D at the time, Martin Mackay, said, no, 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 I want to bring you in actually reporting to me and you've got a mandate 
to work across the enterprise. And it's unlocked all sorts of value that we had no idea were possible in terms of partnerships with commercial, partnerships with BD, partnerships with strategy, um, working very closely with other organizations, with IT, with stats. But it was that mandate to say, no, we are going to place you here with an enterprise mandate that I think unlocked a lot more value uh, for a, a, in terms of application of data sciences at Lexion. So um, in H3, we actually had an interesting uh, journey that our data science team was part of, uh, is still. So our data science team is part of the uh, scientific uh, mm -hmm. discipline, and I belong to the scientific leadership team. But actually about, I tried to think of the time, maybe three or four years ago, but a few years back, we actually made a change to ask IT to be part of the data science team rather than the other way around, because IT tends to be considered some kind of operational function. IT clearly has operational function, but if you think of doing data science right today, actually IT has to be a strategic partner with the data science. That's the extension, right? There's the infrastructure component, there's the best practice component. So we actually made it the other way around. So IT, data science are the same department. Okay. And I, I can talk about this for hours, but I, I won't. Uh, I gave a talk, an entire talk on this at Strata in New York last year on hiring data scientists and how to hire them and build a team. And uh, personally, I think that they should span the enterprise. So we're no longer siloed in just R&D in some weird like back corner coding and, and no one knows what the heck we do. Uh, I think the way I've seen them be really successful is they almost act like consultants to the enterprise. Mm -hmm. So they'll get a lot of requests and they kind of service, but uh, interestingly enough, I've consulted with various groups in say one single pharma company. And you'd be amazed at the redundant analyses that are being done in different groups. Mm -hmm. And this group A was looking for a data set that group B had and had no idea. Right. So that's where you're able to really make impact because you're seeing, if you're working across enterprise, you're seeing and understanding the whole business and can have a comprehensive and cohesive view of what needs to be built. Uh, the other thing is know what you need. So do you really need a statistical modeling person? Are you building uh, predictive models and doing machine learning and, or deep learning or AI? You can, whatever word you, you want to use for it now. But, or, or do you need a business analyst? Do you need someone that can build executive level dashboards and they're really just doing basic aggregations and data munging? Uh, or do you need a data engineer, right? Those are a lot of different skill sets. Some people, unicorns may have all three, but they're tough to find. Uh, so really know what you need and, and have your job descriptions be as crystal clear as possible. Uh, and I think you should be realistic and not look for unicorns. Find people that fit those skill sets and have them work together. Uh, and hopefully you, the person running that team has insights across the enterprise so that you're not just on, in a silo. And I would add, I think the field is changing. So it's, it's a field that's in, in evolving into what it will eventually become. And it's a relatively young area. So it almost doesn't matter where, where it sits. Uh, the, the one piece, the, which is what everyone else has already said, is that it really has to span the enterprise. So you don't want, and I think what some groups have done is they say, well, data science is really IT. So they put it within IT, and they, they focus on you know, the hardware, the systems, the computers, how fast the computer is, the teraflops or whatever. Uh, I don't understand that stuff. To me, it's a box that handles the data. Uh, and so uh, it's not so much the hardware, even though there are people who are, who are knowledgeable about the hardware, but it's really about what you're putting in it. Uh, and so my view is that the, the data science group really should focus on the information. Uh, and not so much the hard, and if you're going to farm out anything, if you're going to use vendors to provide any sorts of sources, and we may disagree, but I think some of the, the IT solutions are the kinds of things that you, because that's changing so much, and there's so many vendors that can provide this for you, and they, now, nowadays, it's a lot of it is outsourced anyway on some location that's not, you know, physically in the same uh, places where you work. Uh, so. My view is that it's not really an IT function, which it looked like it was five or 10 years ago, that the IT people were getting involved because it all had to do with the computers, and it had to do with programs on the computers. So if it's computers and programs, it seems like it was an IT function, but it's about the information. And so what you want are people who are focused on the information, not the box that it's in. 
And so that group could be anywhere. And it could be reporting in, in some cases, reporting in to the CEO, and come, in some cases, reporting in to some higher level person who spans the organization. It could be an R&D, but then you have people in commercial say, how come we don't have one? And so they might develop separate groups. Uh, but you want to make sure that it spans the organization. And I think also, as far as skill sets, there's a wide range of mm -hmm. skill sets. So a data science person is not one person. I think a couple of people have said that. But there's so many different skill sets that you need that you need to look at what is important for you. So if you're doing pharmacogenomics, if you're looking at you know, genomic data or proteomics or whatever the data you're looking at, that's one skill set that's more laboratory focused. If you're looking at more uh, clinical data, that's a different kind of skill set. If you're looking at commercial data, it's a different kind of skill set. There's a lot of overlap among all of them. And so you want people who can overlap. So you want people who understand uh, the data, understand, and can talk to people in commercial, can talk to people in the labs, can talk to people in clinical. Uh, so you want to be able to develop those kinds of skills. But it's not one person. It's a variety of people. And you have to pick what works for you, what kind of needs you have at the current time, and then see how it evolves. But I think moving forward, these data science groups, whatever they're going to be called down the road, are going to be standalone groups within the organization. They're not going to be add-ons. They're not going to be add-ons to R&D. They're not going to be add-ons to clinical or add-ons to INT or uh, add-ons to IT, but they're going to be their own group. It's going to be considered their own function that works with a lot of different groups. And it's just a matter of time. We're starting to get there. We're starting to see more of that. But that, like everything else, it'll take time. <coughs> So we kind of talked about this in our prep call as well. It's a build versus buy question again, but we're talking about people. Do you want to hire very specific skill sets? Are you going to buy them? Or do you want to hire people that are very smart and very curious and you're going to build them? Two, the second one. The second one. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> I would disagree. Okay. You don't that, want smart people? Like, no, that's not. <laughs> you, you don't want the curious people? You want people? smart people no matter what. <laughs> okay, cut. Smart so, people no matter what. So that's, because if you look at resumes, let's say you're looking at a lot of resumes and someone says, look, I'm a smart person. If they're already in the company, that's one thing and you can pull them from somewhere else in the company. But so you, that's not what you're looking for. You're looking for a certain skill set. And I think what's happened over the years in this field is that there are a lot of creative people who didn't necessarily have the underlying credentials, the underlying training, so they had to go outside. So they, maybe they weren't knowledgeable about you know, machine learning, if that was the thing, or they weren't knowledgeable about inferential statistics. So they go outside and they buy it. They don't even know what they're getting because they're not an expert in that area. What you want are smart, creative people no matter what. So that's basic. You know, and if that's your requirement, then I think if that's the only thing you're looking at, then I think you're missing an opportunity. I think really what you want are smart, inquisitive, creative people who can communicate, who have some of the skills that you need. Because you need to have some of these skills internally. You can't just buy it all from the outside because you don't know what you're getting. You need to have people who can interpret what they're getting because the vendors are out there selling whatever they can sell. And some of the vendors are good, some of the vendors are not good. And some of the vendors just uh, have the same product, the same set of uh, you know, consulting, the same set of applications that they sell everywhere. And I know I talked to some of these people and I've gone from, from company to company. They're selling essentially the same package of goods to every company. They're not really customizing it for you. They customize it a little bit, but it's the same package of goods. And if that's what you want, then it's perfect. But if you want something else, you have to know how to get what you want. And in order to do that, you need people who have the training and the knowledge and the skills inside your company to make sure that what you're getting makes sense. And you can't just have a bunch of smart people, inquisitive smart people who don't have training. And I would, ne I would be reluctant to moving forward, hiring people who don't have formal credentials, who don't have formal training in some of the areas relating to data science. So you, and it's, it may not be that everyone knows, that the people you hire know everything about everything, but they should know a lot about something. Uh, and it's not just being inquisitive and creative. Actually, Jerry, I didn't disagree with you at all. I thought in Good. part of our hiring process, we have a resume. People have their PhDs or masters. I thought that's a given. But anyway, I, I agree with you. Good. Yes. 
So I, I would say there's been a bit of a shift over the last five or 10 years where, first of all, you're looking for these, not just unicorns, they're pink unicorns. They're like super rare. They're yeah. bicameral in terms of, you know, they're good at the science, they're good at the life sciences, they're good at the data sciences, and you want as much of that overlap as possible. And maybe five, 10 years ago, you would start with a scientist, the life scientist, the biologist, the chemist, and say, okay, and we'll, we'll extend, you know, their data sciences side, learn the algorithms, learn the methods, et cetera. I would say nowadays that's completely flipped. You start with the data scientist. The toolbox has become so complex, so difficult, and you can teach them the biology along the way. Now, ideally, you know, you want some degree of overlap, but some of the folks that we're bringing in, they have backgrounds um, in digital signal processing, very different fields altogether, and some experience in life sciences, but most importantly, they've demonstrated a great deal of learning agility, how I can go into this field, learn it, make an impact go into this field, learn it, make an impact. So I'd say we're looking for that overlap with actually data sciences being the harder part of the equation versus life sciences defined. But most importantly, looking for data scientists that demonstrate that learning agility, how they can just jump into a new, new field, learn it, make impact. And I, I actually run a uh, Slack community. It's like a chat community for, there's over 200 plus data scientists and tech nerds that I've come across in my travels. It's invite only. It's, it's a great place. And I have a lot of hiring managers on there as well who are data scientists themselves uh, and now manage data scientists. And I asked them, what is the most important quality you look for when hiring data scientists? And there were five options or so. And it was knowledge of algorithms, uh, statistical modeling experience, um, communication, and curiosity. And the top two were problem solving and curiosity. So I think people are looking for uh, self-starting, curious people that like to get their hands on with data. Now it depends on what you need. I personally don't have the time to train and handhold right now. Uh, where I in a larger company, I could help train a data scientist. Uh, so that is going to just be dependent. Uh, but ultimately, I mean, I think people kind of expect you now that you should be able to learn algorithms uh, when you get there. You should be able to pick up different languages. That's kind of just one of the assumptions at this point. Uh, having the ability to communicate and really be ambitious and solve problems, uh, not everyone has. All right. So there's a lower question, um, but I think this applies when you're talking about hiring. This question is, how do you think gender, there are many more men than women in data science, will affect the technology and how it's used? And I think that's a bigger question than just gender, but it's how do, how do a whole variety of people, diversity of voices, impact the questions you even consider asking, and then how you get answers to them? Yeah, I, I could talk about that. <laughs> Also uh, for a week. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, we're building products for everyone, right? And 50% of or so of the world is, is women. So obviously, you want to have as much as diverse of a team as possible if you're building, I mean, software or uh, you're, you're curing disease or you're a clinician. I mean, we obviously need to diversify as much as possible, uh, which is why I also try to uh, implement, you know, hiring practices and interview practices that don't uh, put other people at an extreme disadvantage. Um, but I think it's really important, obviously, that we, we have more women getting into computer science. Uh, I think I was one of like six in my class of 200 or 100 at com Northeastern. Uh, I think that's changing and, and increasing, but I think we just should be welcoming as a community and as scientists. And uh, I've, of course, experienced some interesting uh, obstacles throughout my career, but I, I see it shifting, and I think it's really improving and, and getting better. But is that from, well, is that from just a good idea, like half of us are women, we should be at the table? Do you think it really changes the questions we ask? Do you think it really changes how we use the technology? I, I think, yeah, I think men and women approach problems maybe differently. Um, and so I, I think they, we learn differently as well. Uh, but yeah, it, ultimately, it, it will change uh, the way we're asking questions and, and building products, I think. And what well, I was just going to say, I think it also depends on where you draw from, what sources you draw staff from and new employees from. And I think, uh, for whatever the reason, computer science seems to be heavily dominated by men, but other fields are not. And so data science is not computer science. So if you're only focusing on the computer science aspect, that's true. It's, it's predominantly male. But some of the other areas, and now you know, we see uh, 
universities now offering courses and degrees in business analytics, uh, in applied statistics, in some of these other areas. And that's not true. It's not true that it's all men. It's, it's actually, in some cases, flipped. So there's more women going into the interpreting the data side. In the hardcore computer science piece, still seems to be predominantly male. But on the end of the process, the way I view it, where you're looking at the data, trying to understand the data and interpret the data, uh, there's actually more women going into it. So w what I would suggest is that there, there's an opportunity to stop focusing on hiring people who can deal with the hardware and the, the programming and some of those areas and focus on the people who are learning how to interpret data and how to use data <laughs> and how to ask the questions. There are more and more women and minorities who are majoring in those types of fields at universities today. And I think, you know, and I've had conversations with people in academia, what they found is in some of these programs, white men don't go into them. So they have, so their minority in some of these programs are there aren't any white men in some of these programs. Uh, not that they really are trying to increase the number, but it's an area that people who, aren't, who haven't been historically interested in data science have been, have been going into in greater numbers. And so if you want to equalize the playing field a little bit, focus on hiring people from the business analytics and the applied statistics and the data anal analysis programs at the universities, and then you'll start to flip the ratio a little bit. I guess maybe if I can build on what Jerry said already, um, I feel like this is more a diversity question rather than a gender question mm -hmm. that if you, have a, you want to have a very effective functional data science team, you should focus on bringing people with different strengths, different skill set, <coughs> right? And uh, yeah. I think you kind of touched on that in a little bit that you, you don't looking for just one type people who are only good at one thing and you know with one type of training. You really look at people with very different strengths different skills that maybe it, I think you touch on different training but also different strengths. For example, certain people are more interested in creating creative solution, but certain other people more interested in giving more production solution to really enable a broader community. So there's different certain people are more interested in talking to the biologist and I think to me that's really about building the diversity in the team so you can be most effective in the business. I would, I would add also to be very careful, it's, it's also raised to the starting line. I mean, <clears throat> we're very blessed at Lexion, a third of our team is, is uh, women. Um, I think there's only we, me and one other person that was born in the United States. Um, so it's, it's a very diverse group. However, what's really important, whether it's gender diversity, whether it's cultural diversity, whether it's introversion versus extroversion and mm -hmm. styles, how do you create that space? How do you create that room? There's so many creative aspects to data sciences. There's so many creative processes where it's important to hear all those voices. So I'd say it's one thing to say bring a diverse team together, but it's another thing, how do you bring the most out of that diversity in terms yeah. of hearing all those wonderful ideas? Yeah. All right, thank you all so much. Can you all help me thank the panelists?